Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 11. A New World. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we saw how James wrangled with his parliament over two main issues, political union and money. The Royal Commission had made its recommendations for how to bring England and Scotland closer together, and the English parliament challenged almost all of them. Similarly, parliament balked at granting more money to a king who was a famous spender, despite his excuses actually being genuine. While these, for lack of a better word, constitutional questions were being resolved over the latter half of the 1610s, the foundations of England's overseas empire were being laid. In the New World, after generations of failure, a settlement had been established by the Virginia Company on the east coast of the North American continent. This settlement would avoid the ignominious fate of its predecessors. More than a century had passed since the Spanish and Portuguese had begun establishing their rule over large swathes of the New World. Spanish dominion stretched from the modern US state of California, down the Pacific coast to modern Argentina, as well as the islands of the Caribbean, and that was only in the Americas. Portugal had its own vast claims on modern Brazil, as well as dozens of fortifications and strongholds along the African coast, India, and the East Indies. With the Iberian Union, when Philippe II inherited the crown of Portugal, these two vast intercontinental empires were united in his person. They remained separately governed, but going solely by a map of Philippe III's holdings in 1603, the head start that England faced looked insurmountable. But of course, All empires look invincible on a map. When considering the English successes at sea, both in exploration as well as piracy, it is perhaps surprising that the English arrived so late on the colonisation scene. If we see colonisation as an inevitable result of discovery, then England was, upon the accession of James, hopelessly behind. But... That is assuming that settlement and exploitation of native peoples is the natural outcome of exploration, which is not necessarily true. In the opening chapter to the Oxford History of the British Empire, Nicholas Canny of NUI Galway suggests that England's apparent delay in colonising is evidence that colonisation was not always a guaranteed result of exploration. Instead, changes in international trade and diplomacy led to a shift in priorities for the English crown. As we covered in our episodes on Elizabeth's relations with Spain, early in her reign, the Queen was careful to avoid upsetting the Spanish too much. English merchants and courtiers were satisfied with the wealth that could be gained from expanded trade links, such as with Africa and Russia, and, when relations were not so good, from raiding Spanish shipping and settlements. But that is not to say that colonisation attempts were not made, and in the second half of Elizabeth's reign, there were a few plantation projects in the New World. In 1578, an English merchant imprisoned in Spain translated an account of the Spanish conquest of the Americas. Sir John Eliot describes this translation as mutilated but vivid, and of a distinctly English colouring. For example, The ruler of the Aztecs, Montezuma, is described as calling a parliament, complete with Aztec burgesses, in order to decide on his surrender and vassalage to the King of Spain. Needless to say, this isn't how events occurred, but it sold well, and added to the growing English interest in the New World. In the same year, Humphrey Gilbert, half-brother of Sir Walter Raleigh, received a royal patent, to discover and settle an overseas plantation. His expedition initially failed due to poor weather, and the Queen was reluctant to provide any financial support, and Gilbert was not the best leader. All of these combined led to his fleet being dispersed off the coast of Ireland, 
with many of the ships resorting to piracy. He would lead another expedition in 1583, formally taking possession of a port in Newfoundland, St. John's, but Gilbert would die on the voyage home and nothing would come of the claim for many years. By this point, English explorers had made formal claims of land all across the New World, but none would receive serious attempts at settlement. A year later, Raleigh took up the legacy of his half-brother and received a patent from Elizabeth for overseas plantation. Learning from Gilbert's failure to secure royal funding, Raleigh worked on Elizabeth to convince her of his project's undeniable value and how cheap and easy it would be. Raleigh edited a reconnaissance report of the coast of North America, describing Roanoke Island as, in the words of Dr. John Appleby, a Garden of Eden and its people as pre-Lapsarian naturals who would welcome English settlers with open arms, end quote. Shortly afterwards, Richard Hacklett presented his Discourse on Western Planting to the Queen, which clearly stated the case for state-sponsored colonisation. To put simply, according to Hacklett, setting up colonies in the New World would benefit England in a whole host of ways. They would act as bases for raids on Spanish holdings, they would bring in money from trade and natural resources, Domestic dissidents, both social and religious, could be sent to live there, and the natives could be converted to Christianity. Elizabeth was not convinced by either Raleigh or Hacklett, and so the Roanoke colony went ahead, mainly funded by private enterprise, justified for its potential use as a naval base. Roanoke is sometimes called the Cursed Colony. The first settlement was established in 1585, led by a zealously Protestant, Spanish-hating man named Ralph Lane. Lane complained that the settlers he led were little better than the local savages that he had to contend with. Over the winter of 1585 to 1586, supplies ran low, and the settlers demanded support from the locals. By spring, their hospitality was spent, and the English attacked the Indian settlement and killed one of the Roanoke tribe's chiefs. If this was an attempt to extend the life of the colony, it was a failure, and Lane packed up and went back to London in the summer, narrowly missing a relief expedition led by Sir Richard Grenville in June. Grenville left a small force of soldiers in the settlement, now surrounded by a justifiably annoyed tribe. By the time more English arrived the next year, the soldiers had been killed by the neighbours. That English arrival was by accident. One of the survivors of Lane's expedition, John White, was leading his own colonisation attempt, aimed at settling in Chesapeake Bay. In a twist of historical irony, the crew of his ship mutinied in favour of raiding the Caribbean, and White's party was forced to land on Roanoke Island. White, with little other option, attempted to restart the settlement he had earlier abandoned. He departed later that year to gather a new contingent of supplies and colonists, but was delayed for three years. By the time he returned in 1590, he found the settlement mysteriously abandoned. The chief theories are that they were killed by Indians, although no bodies and no sign of violence was found, or that they abandoned the colony and assimilated into local tribes. For our purposes, the abandonment of Roanoke was also the abandonment of general English colonisation. It had proved incredibly difficult to organise, and the hostile situation with Spain only added to the challenges, not only as a deterrent for supply ships, but also by offering better opportunities for wealth through plunder. The English had learnt from the experience, but it would be some time before these lessons were put into practice. After the death of Elizabeth, there were further attempts at colonisation, but all failed with little fanfare. In 1604, a small settlement was established by what the English called the Weapoco River, in modern Guiana in South America. In short order, the Europeans were stricken with tropical diseases, and the colony was abandoned less than two years later. In 1605, a colony was established on the island of St. Lucia 
and in 1609 another was settled on Granada. Both failed from a combination of disease and native hostility, as did an abortive attempt to settle in the Massachusetts Bay, at Sagadahoc in the modern US state of Maine. That settlement consisted of 120 men and lasted only two years. Their lasting influence was the accidental introduction of European diseases to the native population, leading to an enormous loss of life that would pay dividends a decade later when the English returned to Massachusetts. But that is for another time. So now, with most of the failures out of the way, and as we come to Virginia, it's probably best to acknowledge the problem of names. Specifically, the names for the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas. In preparing this episode, I was particularly concerned with avoiding upsetting modern-day descendants of the pre-European peoples of the New World. As someone from the British Isles, I'm particularly underexposed to political and cultural trends surrounding this topic, and I've done my best to get up to speed. My understanding is that there is no consensus on exactly what term is correct. I thought Native American was the most acceptable, a replacement to the antiquated and inaccurate American Indian. But then I found out that not all Native Americans acknowledge the term, either because it's seen as yet another label imposed on them by outsiders, or because American Indian has been embraced after centuries of use. Likewise, many historians still use American Indian, or use it interchangeably with other terms, like Amerindian, which all mean different things to different people. That's only referring to the modern United States. In Canada, there is a whole other controversy, with First Nations and Aboriginals and Inuit as well as Indians. Add into that mix the names of individual tribes and confederations, and their translation and adoption by the colonists with all the errors and generalizations you would expect from these sources, and it's a minefield. I am honestly terrified of my ignorance causing offence to any Native Americans or American Indians in my audience. So going forward, and for the rest of Pax Britannica, I will mainly use American Indian and Native American to describe, fairly interchangeably, the people of America. But I will do my utmost to be precise when the narrative covers particular indigenous groups. While we're on the topic, there will also be cases where I quote primary sources that use unpleasant language. In most cases, I won't be omitting such words, but I will try and give a warning to skip ahead for those so inclined. In the high likelihood that I do make a mistake in nomenclature, please accept my apologies ahead of time. So, Virginia. In 1606, the Virginia Company of London was founded by Royal Charter as a joint stock company and granted the right to settle along a vast stretch of the eastern seaboard of North America. Three ships, with 105 male settlers and 39 crew, left England in December of that year and arrived four months later in April 1607. The sealed orders of the company were opened, and among other instructions, rather awkwardly named John Smith to be one of the new settlement's leaders. This was awkward, because Smith had apparently attempted a mutiny during the voyage and was due to be hanged once they landed. He was duly freed from confinement and spared the gallows, which had to be a confusing turn of events for Smith. The expedition chose the place for their settlement, which would in time be called Jamestown, on Jamestown Island, which was sat in the James River. They had earlier named two capes on the Virginia coast after the king's two sons, Cape Henry and Cape Charles, because you can never honour a king too much. The site was chosen partly for its defensive capabilities. The island, or rather the peninsula, was sheltered from the coast and so slightly more protected from seaborne raids, like from the Spanish. Likewise, it was uninhabited by Virginian Indians. That turned out to be for good reason, as game was fairly rare on the island, and its marshy conditions were a breeding ground for mosquitoes and their ever-present companion, malaria. Christopher Newport, the leader of the expedition, returned to London with a cargo of what appeared to be gold and left the colonists to establish their new home. The all-male colonists were split into three groups, each one with a task. One was to build the fort, which was completed in June. 
One was to plant crops to eat, which they largely failed at, and the third group was to explore the local area and make contact with the locals. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A B B E L dot com code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. In the early years, Jamestown looked like it would share the fate of every other English settlement in the New World. Relations with the locals, the Powhatan Confederacy, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, became strained very quickly and settlers were killed and injured in conflict with the Powhatan. Famously, it was in one of these skirmishes that John Smith was captured, and according to his later account, was only spared execution by the intervention of the chief's daughter, a certain Pocahontas. Conditions on the ground were only hampered by the lack of clarity from the company. Some investors favoured short-term profit, and pushed for the colonists to scout for precious metals like the Spanish had found in such abundance. Others saw the colony as little more than a military outpost in the event of continued war with Spain, or as a counterweight to England's other European rivals. The colonists themselves were unclear on their own objectives, with some searching in vain for gold and silver instead of focusing on survival. Smith later wrote that it was he who had whipped them into shape, but as a prolific writer, he got to make the record. By the time Newport had returned with supplies from England in January of 1608, two-thirds of the original settlers had died. Along with new supplies, Newport brought with him additional colonists. I imagine that Smith and his survivors horribly hid the bodies of their predecessors. It's all fine, they all just went to a farm... The supplies were destroyed in a fire, and Smith later recorded that the number of settlers were halved over the next few months through hunger and disease. Newport had returned to England, loaded up with another cargo of gold, which was, of course, fool's gold and so virtually worthless. He returned with a second supply in October 1608, again loaded with vital supplies and new colonists to make up for the ever-present attrition. Among these new settlers were the first not from England, with craftsmen and skilled workers present to help create much-needed materials. Glassmakers and carpenters were especially valuable additions to the colony. Having dropped off his passengers, Newport searched for the remains of Roanoke Colony and for any sign of real gold. He also brought complaints from company investors about the lack of profit that the colony had shown. When Newport returned to England, he did not do so with a hold full of worthless metals, but the produce of the New World. Different types of lumber, tar, glass, and ashes. Hardly what the investors had been hoping for, and not a particularly valuable haul, which did not impress the company when Newport arrived back in London in January 1609. Before Newport's third supply mission took place, the company dispatched Samuel Argyll, to find a shorter route to the colony. He managed to do so, 
shaving weeks off of the travel time, and so saving provisions, which he passed on to the colony. On credit, of course. Newport's third supply did more than simply reinforce England's first American colony. It accidentally made another. James granted a new charter for the Virginia Company to allow further support for Jamestown. Maybe all that naming had gone down well. The third supply consisted of nine ships, over 500 settlers, including women and children, livestock, as well as enough supplies to feed the larger colony for more than a year. Newport himself captained a new flagship, the Sea Venture, constructed specifically for supplying the colony. On the 2nd of June, 1609, the fleet left Plymouth for the New World. The flotilla remained cohesive for almost two months of the journey, until a tempest struck on the 25th of July. The ships were buffeted by the storm for three days, some being split from the others. By the 11th of August, five of the ships had collected together once more, and reached the James River. By October, two more members of the supply fleet had arrived in Virginia. Two ships were as yet unheard of. The Catch, which would later be judged lost at sea, and the Sea Venture, the flagship of the flotilla, the carrier of most of the supplies, and the vessel of Christopher Newport. But the Venture had not been sunk. Instead, taking on water, and with little option, its captain, Admiral Summers, beached the ship on a reef of a small island. All souls aboard survived the wreck, but the ship was no longer seaworthy. Luckily, they had all the supplies they needed to establish a settlement. They had landed on the Atlantic archipelago of Bermuda, and formally, if not intentionally, claimed it for the English crown. After nine or ten months, the unexpected residents of Bermuda fashioned two boats from local trees and the remains of the venture, determined to complete their journey to Virginia. Surely, almost a year after the supply mission had been due to arrive, they would find a flourishing, vibrant, and model society. Instead, they found Jamestown in ruins, its population decimated, and the survivors sickly and malnourished. While the survivors of the venture were stranded on Bermuda, they had avoided the starving time. To rewind to the arrival of the rest of the third supply fleet in August, John Smith was surprised to find that the colony had now gained more than 300 new mouths to feed, but most of their supplies were probably at the bottom of the ocean. Adding to this, a drought had afflicted the few crops the colonists had actually managed to grow, and relations with the Powhatan were strained. It is possible that the coming calamity would have been averted, or at least dulled, had Smith remained in charge of the colony to enforce discipline and rationing. But towards the end of his term of office as governor, Smith was injured in an accidental explosion of gunpowder, and forced to take passage back to England with Argyll. Whether he would have been able to keep more settlers alive will never be known. There were initial conclusions that the settlement had been attacked or besieged by the Powhatan, which caused the damage to the fort and prevented the colonists from gathering food, but that is far from proven. It is just as likely that the wooden structures were cannibalised for firewood, rather than enemy attack. Speaking of cannibalism, that too is suspected to have occurred, with human remains being found with marks of being butchered for meat. By the time the Bermuda castaways arrived in Jamestown, between 60 and 90 settlers, out of more than 500, still lived. The new deputy governor of the colony, Sir Thomas Gates, attempted to keep the settlement afloat for a month or so, but it was eventually decided that it was untenable. All the surviving colonists were loaded onto two ships, the same ones constructed on Bermuda, and the English abandoned Jamestown on the 7th of June, 1610, and they sailed down the James River. This was the end of the most successful English attempt at colonisation. Except, of course, it wasn't. As the survivors sailed down the James, they were intercepted by three vessels on the 8th or 9th of June. 
reinforcements and supplies had arrived, with the governor himself, Thomas West, the third Baron de la War. Delaware, which is how I'm going to be pronouncing his name, forced the survivors to turn around. Arriving back at the ruins of Jamestown on the 10th, Delaware assumed his governorship with great, and frankly considering the state of the colony, ridiculous pomp. Fifty of his red-cloaked halberdiers lined the road into the fort, which he rode through. Delaware instituted martial law, and the settlers were set to work repairing and reinforcing the colony. With his well-armed and well-trained veteran force, Delaware ordered the conquest of vital surrounding areas, along the river as well as further inland, beginning the First Anglo-Poetan War. He was not kind to the Poetan, ordering mutilations and burnings of the locals that resisted, describing them as Canaanites. While Smith had been antagonistic to the Poetan, building forts and occasionally raiding, Delaware prosecuted a war. After a successful attack on one of the Powhatan vassals, or Confederacy members, up to 75 Indians were killed, and a wife and children of one of the Confederacy's leaders was captured. The mother was executed by sword in Jamestown, while the children had been thrown into the James River and shot while the English withdrew from the attack. The English and Powhatan would remain at war for the next four years. Delaware would remain as governor of Virginia in person until March 1611, and of that time only rarely left his ship or his residence due to illness. His sudden departure was highly embarrassing for the company, who had to publish a pamphlet explaining why he had suddenly left. His deputies, Gates, Argyll, and Sir Thomas Dale, who had largely been leading the colony while Delaware fought dysentery, remained and continued to govern the settlement. It appears to be during Delaware's time in Virginia that the true value of the colony became abundantly clear to the English, and the growing talk of abandoning the settlement was silenced for good. The colony may not have gold or silver mines, but what it had was tobacco. From 1611, a feverish expansion of the colony took place, as the profit that could be made by even a small plantation attracted hundreds more settlers from England. That the ludicrous mortality rate hadn't improved was little issue for either the company or prospective colonists. We're getting ahead of the narrative, but to put the death toll in perspective, by the end of the century, over 116,000 European settlers had arrived in Virginia. Despite this immigration, and the births that had taken place over the decades, the total population of the colony was only 90,000. Of course, some of the immigrants had only stayed temporarily, but still, that suggests an incredibly high mortality rate. In order to enjoy the financial benefits of the colony, other, more spiritual benefits had to be abandoned by the wayside. The classical ideal of the colony, that it would be a model and godly society made up of honest Englishmen, fell under the flood of settlers seeking the apparently easy wealth that Tobacco Plantation offered. The other downside was the invisible hand of the market. After the initial profit that Tobacco offered attracted hundreds more cultivators, the price abruptly crashed and left many destitute. Yet, long term, the value of Tobacco was assured. The market only grew, as... For some reason, people really struggled to stop smoking it. I'm sure it will never catch on. We will return to Virginia many, many times in the future. The future of the colony, while requiring regular supplies from England until the end of the century, was now on a much more secure foundation. By 1613, a formal settlement has been established on Bermuda, which came under the control of the Virginia Company, and likewise became home to tobacco plantations. England now had footholds on the other side of the Atlantic, and these were the first successful routes of not one, but two future hegemonic empires. This was the true victory of the First Battle of the Atlantic. Spain had failed to keep England, France, and its rebellious Dutch subjects from crossing the ocean, and it was now no longer the only European power in the Americas. 
Next week, we will return to Ireland. I know I said that last episode, but discussing Virginia ran on longer than I planned. We will see exactly how the Ulster Plantation, which was occurring at the same time as Virginia, took place, and how the two settlement projects, despite being separated by a vast body of water, were similar. The poll for the special episode is still up. I've extended it by a week, so if you are listening to this on release, you have a few more days to make your voice heard. As I record, the most popular topic is European warfare. If that isn't what you'd like to hear about, then go cast your vote. If it is, well, you better go support it. They just want to go and vote against it. If you want to join the House of Lords, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. My favourite review this week is from Rob C. in Australia. He says, I am really enjoying this one. It is presented with a fantastic level of professionalism, clearly spoken and well written. This is wonderful history, suited to both the interested layperson or someone who has researched this period, such as myself. This is definitely going onto my subscribe list. Thank you so much, Rob. That's amazing. It's inc- I, it, it still blows my mind how global this uh, this podcast has become. So, I thank you. Before we go, let me thank some of my House of Lords. Uh, so, thank you to Elaine, Countess Dickens, Jean, Countess Buckley, Christopher, Earl Grogan, Brendan, the first Earl Bonner, Lady Michelle, Duchess of Devon, and the Royal Headsman, executed today. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music to today's episode, to my House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>